Hello friends, this is Jan Curcio and welcome back to Breaking Bread for You. In this video, we will examine one of the most controversial theologies, supersessionism, better known as replacement theology, that argues that the Church of Jesus Christ has replaced Israel as God's special people, thereby becoming the new Israel. And as controversy goes, it has become complicated and when theology becomes complicated, it is best to re-examine the scriptures to discover God's truth on the matter, oftentimes skewed in church tradition and doctrine. And so we will examine the scriptures supersessionists use to validate their position. And they are the parables of the wicked tenants in Matthew 21, Mark 12, and Luke 20, and the two sons in Matthew 21. And let me say that replacement theology is not new, having proponents from the second century church fathers who taught that the Jews forfeited being God's special people due to having breached the Mosaic covenant through disobedience to God's law. In particular, by following after false gods and cultic practices of their Gentile neighbors. And in the fifth century, when Roman Emperor Constantine made Christianity the state religion, he mandated that all ties with Judaism be broken, even banning the observance of the Jewish feasts and Sabbaths and replacing Sabbath observance with Sunday worship. Supersessionists have cited evidence from the Old Testament, such as from the prophet Jeremiah, who foretold that due to Judah's breach of covenant, Jehovah would destroy Judah through foreign invasion and exile, Jeremiah 1, 14 and 15, which was fulfilled in 587 BC when King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon invaded Judah, destroying the Jerusalem temple and taking the Jews into exile. Yet, the, this ignores the fact that in 536 BC, King Cyrus of Persia conquered Babylon and liberated the Jews to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple and reestablish the sacrificial system. What supersessionists do not take into consideration as well is what Jeremiah foretold to the Jews, and I quote, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them up by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Jeremiah 31, 31. And this prophecy was fulfilled in Jesus Christ, who declared, For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Matthew 26, 28. And Jesus declared this to the Israelite disciples. Opponents also argue that Israel is no longer God's special people, with the church having replaced them due to the treachery of the ruling body of elders and priests in Jerusalem, the Sanhedrin, in conspiring to have Jesus crucified, as well as relentlessly having persecuted the church. They recall the destruction of the temple in 70 AD by Emperor Titus of Rome in response to a Jewish uprising, which they point out has been left unbuilt for the past 2,000 years, even after the Jews returned to the land to reestablish the nation of Israel in 1948. Many of them agree that being forbidden to worship on the Temple Mount by the Palestinian authorities is sure evidence that Israel has been forsaken by God. Since the temple and the sacrificial system was central to biblical Judaism, and still is for Orthodox Jews who relentlessly attempt to worship on the mount, its absence for supersessionists marks the end of Israel's status as God's special people, and Judaism being just another dead religion. Yet most unsettling is that replacement theology is based on racism, anti-Semitism, and revenge for Christ's crucifixion and the persecution of the church. And that has contributed to the persecution of the Jews over the centuries, 
most re recent being the Holocaust, in which many German Gentiles had accepted Nazi propaganda against the Jews, particularly that they had been replaced as God's special people by the church, which in that country was mainly the Roman Catholic and Lutheran churches. Today, supersessionism is embraced by them, as well as in the reform branch of Christianity. But this is not to say that all members of these denominations buy into this doctrine. And let me point out the confusion between the two entities of the nation of Israel and spiritual Israel, Israel being the historical and geographical homeland for the Jews, reestablished in 1948, and spiritual Israel being the people of God. Yet there is another group of God's people, the early Old Testament saints who knew Jehovah Ye and walked with him, indicating that God's people existed long before both the establishment of the nation of Israel and the Church of Jesus Christ. And we first learn of them in the book of Genesis, wherein is said, And as for Seth, to him also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. Then man began to call on the name of the Lord. Genesis 4:26. And calling on the name of the Lord simply means praying to God for grace and favor. And so before Israel was formed from the sons of Jacob, there was a people who worshiped the true God of creation, the people of God, even spiritual Israel. And the most notable of them were Enoch, Noah, and Abraham, the last two being in covenant with God. And that for me confounds the teaching that the church replaced Israel as God's special people, for the church would have had to replace their predecessors as well, even Abraham to whom Jehovah promised countless progeny, who would be a blessing to the world. And that blessing is found in Jesus of Nazareth, born an Israelite who provided the means of salvation to Israel and the world. Jesus did not come to earth to start a new religion, but to fulfill the existing one, not to replace it, but to bring it to its fullness. And based on this, it can be said up front that God does not replace what he establishes. That all said, let's take a look at the most basic tenets of replacement theology to know exactly what it advocates, bearing in mind that not all proponents agree to all of them, and that there are additional tenets to these. The first being, Israel being the Jewish people, or reflective of Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, has now in Christ been replaced in lieu of God's new paradigm of the Christian church. That is, due to the divine exclusion of Israel, the church is the historic continuation of Israel as the new Israel. The second tenet is the Jewish people individually or collectively are no longer a chosen people. There is no spiritual significance for the Jew, nor is there any difference between Jews and other nationalities. Three, apart from repentance, a new birth or incorporation into the church, the Jewish people have no eschatological future, nor do they have any hope or calling within the plan of God. The same is true for all other nations or people groups. Four, since Pentecost in Acts 2, the term Israel exclusively refers to the church, not to the Jews. Furthermore, Jesus is the primary symbol of the new Israel. Borrowing from Moses, Jesus became the deliverance motif for the body of Christ. And five, since the creation of the church in Acts 2, all promises, covenants, and blessings ascribed to Israel within the Bible have been transferred to the church, which has superseded Israel. On the contrary, the Jews, in rejecting Christ, not only are excluded from God's blessings, they also are recipients of the curses foretold in the Old Covenant Scriptures. 
Bear these tenets in mind as we examine the parables of the wicked tenants and the two sons, from which supersessionists have defended their position. First, let me say that the setting of these parables is in the temple precinct, two days after Jesus' triumphal entrance into Jerusalem, when he chased the money changes from the temple court. This was the same day Jesus cursed the fig tree and five days before he was crucified. His audience consisted of the chief priests and scribes who by questioning his authority in the wake of his cleansing the temple prompted Jesus to reveal his and their fate through these parables, which were so effective that his antagonists recognized that he was talking about them. And besides the chief priests and scribes, his audience included his disciples, other followers who had come to hear him teach, and those who had come from afar to celebrate Passover at the temple. And reading from Matthew 21 in the New King James Version, beginning in verse 33, it reads, Here another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it dug a wine press in it and built a tower. And he leased it to vine dresses and went into a far country. Now when vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dresses that they might receive its fruit. And the vine dresses took his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Then last of all, he sent his son to them saying, they'll respect my son. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. And then Jesus asked his listeners, therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? They said to him, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And whoever falls on the stone will be broken, but on whom it falls, it will grind him to powder. Verses 33 to 44. So the landowner is Jehovah, the vineyard is the kingdom of God, which he leaves in the hands of devious tenants, representing the hypocritical chief elders and priests who are to oversee and care for God's people yet had failed to do that miserably. The landowners, servants sent to the tenants, symbolize the prophets whom Jehovah sent to one Israel time and time again of the judgment to come due to their spiritual fruitlessness, as was the case with John the Baptist. The construction of the wine press represents the ministry of bringing the people to spiritual maturity with the hedge and tower representing the protective eye of God over his kingdom, under which nothing goes unnoticed by him. The idea of the owner leaving his vineyard to the tenants represents God who is absent, yet still in ownership, entrusting the care of his kingdom to those he called to oversee and teach the people how to live for a holy God. And the landowner's son, of course, represents Jesus of Nazareth, Jehovah's Messiah, whom the Jewish rulers feared due to his growing popularity with the people and rejected even having him killed for his inheritance, which was to have authority over the people. And although Jesus proved to be God's Messiah through performing specific signs and wonders known by the Jews that only the Messiah could do, he did not meet their expectation of the one who would liberate them from Roman rule and reestablish their autonomy in the land. And even more so, the priests and elders despised his teachings, for they exposed what they were, faithless and corrupt. And having Jesus crucified, the chief priests, 
and elders could continue to rule over the Jews in their tyrannical manner, always expecting to be honored, while casting out anyone who opposed them, as they had with the man born blind whom Jesus healed. John 9. Now, in the culture of the ancient Near East, it was common for foreigners to establish farms in agricultural areas of Israel, drawn by its fertile soil and mild climate. And they would lease their land to local caretakers, go back to their homelands, later to return to collect their share of the harvest. In the case of planting grapevine saplings, it could be four years before fruit would mature enough to be harvested. And the mature grapes represent here spiritual fruit, the righteousness, justice, and mercy that was required, but lacking in God's servants, the religious leaders. And then it is said that the landowner returned after his servants and son were killed to expel the wicked tenants and to leave his vineyard to a people, that is a group of people, who would faithfully serve the landowner. So what Jesus had in mind was not replacing the nation of Israel with another nation or nationality, but replacing the corrupt religious leadership represented by wicked overseers with godly overseers, always having in mind his Israelite disciples whom he appointed to watch over his church in his absence. And so it is illogical to say that Christ would replace Israel since his replacements were Israelites. The parable of the wicked tenants clearly illustrates the replacement of overseers, the wicked tenants, not the nation Israel that is symbolized by the vineyard in this parable. And reading the parable of the two sons, I quote from Matthew 28, verses 28 through 32. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first they answered, Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. Through this illustration, Jesus compared the unfaithful religious leaders who, although originally said yes to their commission to turn Israel to God, did not, to the rebellious who eventually repented and did obey God's call to turn the people to God. And given that the parable is about two sons from one father, I take it that the sons represent Israelites, not one being Jewish and the other Gentile. Again, it is clear from this parable that it does not represent Israel being replaced by the church, but the Israelite religious rulers, who although were called to turn the people to God, would not, being replaced by humble Israelites, tax collectors and prostitutes, and maybe he's alluding here to Matthew for one, who had repented and became obedient to that call, pointing to Christ's appointed apostles. And returning to the five tenets of replacement theology, beginning with the first, that the church has replaced Israel as the special people of God and the historical continuation of Israel, in spite of the Jews return to the land in 1984 to establish their nationhood, we must look at what Paul taught the Gentile believers in Rome concerning their relationship to the Jews. And he said, if some of the branches were broken off, that is Jews who had fallen away, and you being a wild olive tree, the Gentiles, were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree. Do not boast against the branches, but if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you, that is, they don't support Judaism, but Judaism supports them. 
Romans 11, 17 through 18. You will say then, Paul said, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said, because of unbelief, they were broken off and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell, severity, but toward you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. Romans 11, 19 through 22. This well argues against replacement theology and that the Gentile Church of Jesus Christ is placed in the humble position of having been grafted into the olive tree, spiritual Israel, and being supported by it, not the other way around. There is nothing here that sounds like replacement of one entity with another. And then Paul continued to say, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham, Romans 9, 6 and 7. Here he is again distinguishing spiritual Israel from the nation of Israel, stating that the true Israel, spiritual Israel, are those who are in Christ, whether Jew or Gentile. And the Apostle Paul refers to Jews and Gentiles coming together in the true faith as one new man, Ephesians 2, 14 and 15. But there is no hint of replacing one with another, but on the contrary, joining together Jews and Gentiles who are in Christ into one people, a spiritual entity that was a fulfillment, the fulfillment of God's plan for Israel to reveal the true God of creation to all peoples. And the church comprised of Jews and Gentiles has done this for the past 2000 years and will continue to do that until Christ returns. And Jesus said, I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, the sheep being Israelite followers. He goes on to say, and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd, John 10, 14 through 16. So here Jesus distinguishes between his Israelite flock and his other flock, the Gentiles, together becoming one flock without indication of replacement or superiority of one to another. And so I have to say that the first tenant is false. And in regard to the second tenant in which the Jewish people individually or collectively are no longer a chosen people, having no spiritual significance nor being any different than any other people, I have to point out here in regard to chosenness what Jesus declared in his illustration of the faithless servant in Matthew 22 verse 14, saying, many are called, but few are chosen. And who are the chosen few? Those who make peace with God through receiving and following Jesus, his only begotten Son and Messiah, whether they be Jew or Gentile. For as Paul asserted, for there is no respect of persons with God, Romans 2.11. Hence we can know that both Jew and Gentile are equally loved by God, having God's grace, saving grace, equally extended to them all, the one new man. And for the proponents of replacement theology you say that Christ is through with Israel, I have to recall Paul asserting that Christ was not so, but continuously reaching out to them. Romans 11, 1 and 2, 11, 23, 26, and 29. And going back to the Old Testament, the prophet Hosea said, O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me, is thine help, 13.9. In fact, all of the Old Testament prophets understood that although God would severely punish Israel for rebellion, he would never abandon them. And after the prophets foretold of the judgment to come to them, 
That foretelling was most often followed by a message of hope and redemption. And of course, that redemption was ultimately realized in the advent of Christ and what he accomplished on the cross. I have to say that there is a massive amount of Old Testament material that speaks of Israel's eternal relationship with the Jehovah, and that cannot be ignored, as supersessionists have done. Most revealing of Jehovah's faithfulness to his unfaithful people is illustrated in the prophet Hosea, who went after his adulterous wife to redeem her and to bring her back to the marriage. And as much as Israel proved to be faithless, resulting in God's judgment visiting them, he was merciful, always promising that he would restore his people. And if Jehovah would not do that, how could the church of Jesus Christ ever trust him to be merciful to them when we have been as faithless and rebellious as Israel? And so in order to explain away all of the Old Testament witness of the eternality of God's relationship to Israel, supersessionists spiritualize God's redemption of the nation of Israel by transferring it to the church. Yet, if you will recall that when Paul set out to evangelize the Roman Empire, it was to the Jew first and then to the Gentiles. If the Jews had no hope or calling, Paul would have bypassed them and gone straight to the Gentiles. And we must realize that many of the churches that were planted throughout the Roman Empire were comprised of both dispersed Jews and native Gentiles, Paul's one new man. So I take it that this tenet is also false. And concerning the third tenet, apart from repentance, a new birth, or incorporation into the church, the Jewish people have no eschatological future, meaning end-time future, nor do they have any hope or calling within the plan of God. The same is true for all other nations or people groups. Now, I have to say here that both Jew and Gentile have an eschatological future determined by whether they are in Christ or not, saved or not. I can also say that Israel has a particular eschatological future that Paul understood, and I quote him, also quoting Isaiah 59, 20, saying, and so all Israel will be saved or redeemed, as it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob, Romans 11, 26. Now, Paul is not referring to every Israelite being saved who ever lived, as I have heard Messianic Jews claim, for that would include Judas and the priests who conspired to have Jesus crucified. Here, Paul is speaking about the Jews who will survive the Great Tribulation, a remnant from which the nation of Israel will be reestablished, as was foretold by the Old Testament prophets. And to name a few references, we have Isaiah 34, Jeremiah 30, and Ezekiel 36. So we can safely say that the third tenet is false. And the fourth tenet claims that since Pentecost in Acts 2, the term Israel exclusively refers to the church, not to the Jews. Furthermore, Jesus is the primary symbol of the new Israel. Borrowing from Moses, Jesus became the deliverance motif for the body of Christ. To begin with, I object to Jesus being thought of as a symbol of the new Israel or the deliverance motif for the church, for Christ is not a symbol or a motif of anything. He is God. Secondly, I do not find in the New Testament any reference to the church as the new Israel. Jesus and the New Testament writers never wrote that he came to usher in the new Israel. As we know, he had the kingdom of God. And the fifth and last tenet, supersessionists believe that they inherit the blessings promised to, uh, to Israel outlined in Deuteronomy 28, but are exempt from the promised curses therein for their disobedience to God's law. This is blatantly prejudiced, for if the Jews had to be cursed for rebellion, then so should the Church of Jesus Christ, who throughout the centuries have been rebellious. 
And I conclude that although the church having replaced Israel as God's special people may sound right to you, it has no scriptural basis. It is a man-made doctrine. And I thank you for viewing, and I hope that this has encouraged you to not only study the scriptures, but to base your theological positions on what Jesus and the writers of the Bible actually taught. Although traditions and doctrines can be skewed, the word of God illuminated by the Holy Spirit will not fail you. I urge you to not take any theology or church tradition for granted. Examine the scriptures to find if there is any truth in them. And I encourage you to immerse yourselves in the scriptures to learn what the writers wanted you to know about the Lord, the one who loves you more than you can ever imagine, and who gave us his word that we may be taught how to love him back. God bless you all as you learn of him, and please share this with someone who might need encouragement in the faith.